assistance at Iowa State, a visual exploration. This event is part of our celebration of free expression during First Amendment Days this week. This is our 19th year of having First Amendment Days on the Iowa State campus. This is what we believe to be the longest running student celebration of the five freedoms of the First Amendment of any uh, institution of higher education. So we are pretty proud of that fact. My name is Julie Rosa and I am the uh, chair of the First Amendment Committee and I also serve as the First Amendment Specialist here at Iowa State. The Greenlee School of Journalism and Communication is proud to partner with the experts from University Museums for this session. This will take us on a virtual exploration of art on campus that seeks to challenge the status quo. We will begin by listening to University Museum staff share with us uh, information about several works of art on campus. We'll then shift to more of a question and answer time with the audience. So please feel free to type your questions or comments in the chat on YouTube. We will end the program promptly at one or perhaps a few minutes earlier. Now let me introduce our experts. First of all, Lila Anderson is the curator of education and visual literacy. She directs the museum's education program overseeing a robust roster of public programs as well as curriculum programs for Iowa State students and educational exhibition series. She also leads tours, discussions, and lectures for university students and the public. Sydney Marshall is the curator of the Art on Campus program, among others. She works with committees to acquire objects for the Art on Campus collection, maintains the public art collection, and coordinates coordinates exhibitions in the Anderson Sculpture Garden and the Christian Peterson Art Museum. Adrienne Jeanette is the curator of the Brunier Art Museum. She uh, curates multiple exhibitions at Brunier and, uh, excuse me, throughout the academic year, along with creating unique curriculum interactions using the museum's permanent collections across various colleges and departments. Without further ado, let me turn it over to our experts. Thank you for having us. Um, and thank you for the introductions. Um, I'll just start with a brief kind of uh, introduction to what University Museums is, and then we're gonna jump right into talking about some specific works of art. Uh, so University Museums, uh, we actually represent five entities across campus, um, including uh, the Brunier Art Museum, the Art on Campus Collection, which is public art on campus, the Christian Peterson Art Museum, the Anderson Sculpture Garden, and the Farmhouse Museum. So for one staff that has a lot of different um, areas on campus, and so there's a really a wealth of art that's available to the ISU community, and we're just going to kind of scratch the surface today of um, a, few, a few of the objects we have and uh, you know, there's a lot of different ones that we could have chosen to focus on for this idea of how artists are um, creating space for dialogue with um, their artwork and addressing ideas of um, just social justice, of politics, of protest, um, all these different ideas and, you know, just open expression. Um, so we're happy to be a part of the First Amendment days, and I'm actually going to start uh, by sharing my screen. And what we're gonna do is each of us will talk about uh, two different uh, works of art. And um, we're, happy, we're happy to take questions throughout too, so you can use that chat. But I'm gonna go ahead and share this. Okay. Let's see, I'm gonna make this big, here we go, okay. So I'm gonna start by talking about a uh, work of art that is in the library. So this is something that you can go and see. It's on the second floor of the library. Uh, it's a blind paper embossment. Uh, it's by an artist named Bethany Collins. Uh, the title of this one is April 12th, 1963. Uh, Bethany Collins is a contemporary artist. She is from Alabama, uh, was born and raised there. 
um, but currently works, um, lives and works in Chicago. Um, her work uh, very much explores the relationship between uh, language and race and, and power and how, um, you know, ways that we communicate um, through languages, the, through language, the restrictions that can come with that, um, and also how we record and share information, um, both contemporary and historical. Um, so a lot of her, uh, her body of work really deals with this idea of, of words and language. And so this uh, specific artwork that we have in our collection of hers is, uh, well, when you look at it from a far way away, you're like, that's a blank piece of paper over there. <laughs> like, what is this white, you know, just blank, uh, frame on the wall. And as you get up closer to it, um, you can start to see these, that it's a, basically the front page of a newspaper. And she's embossed the paper in, so it really just kind of has this texture that becomes visible as you get up close to it. And as you start to read the newspaper, it shows, this is actually a historical, you know, it's a historical document. Um, and it's a, the front page of the Birmingham News um, from April 12th, 1963. And so you can kind of look through and it just, uh, you know, has various headlines on it. And for me, this artwork is interesting in the way it kind of slowly reveals itself to you. And you have to kind of think about it and look closely at it and interact with it to be able to sort of understand what's happening. Because the more you think about that date and that time of what's happening in Birmingham, Alabama on April 12th of 1963, you realize that there's headlines or things missing from this newspaper, right? So it's, uh, there's many things happening during the civil rights movement um, at that time. Literally within days of this, Martin Luther King has written his letter from Birmingham jail um, on April 12th, there's the Children's March um, in Birmingham. So there's all these very important events that are happening on that day, yet there's no mention of them in the newspaper and in the headlines. So I think here, Collins is exploring this idea of absence as, um, as, as how, you know, as being so important, what we don't include in our telling of our stories and telling of our history can be really powerful, what is left out and what is just becomes this kind of blank, blank slate or whitewashed away. Um, so I think when you look at this artwork at first, you might not think this is something that's political or speaking about resistance. But as you consider it, get close to it and realize this content of what is happening, you know, what she's dealing with, then it becomes something that is very uh, powerful. And, and what does that mean when uh, the press isn't covering these stories and isn't um, sharing all of these voices and all these you know, parts of our history? So this is the first one that I wanted to show. And actually on the next slide, I these are just some closer up images so you can see kind of as you get up to it, you can see more clearly um, the, the text of this one. The next one that I'm gonna talk about, um, it's actually also in the library. This one is up on the third floor of the library, um, is a print uh, by a woman named Emily Arthur. Um, she is a printmaker and she's also a faculty um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, in the printmaking. Uh, she, in her work, thinks about um, the idea of kind of displacement and um, the environment. She is half Cherokee and half um, Scottish, and she brings her own um, personal background and experience into the art making uh, that she does and into her artistic practice. So the one that we have here in the library uh, has, again, uses a historical document, so text document. So I have kind of zoomed in on it on the one side of the screen. Um, 
this text that says Cherokee by blood. And this was, is a reference to basically an, an enrollment that was happening um, between 1906 and 1910 of um, Eastern Cherokee, basically having to prove that they were uh, part of the Cherokee nation and, and, and trying to retain their identity and tribal enrollment. Um, because, and this would have, of course, been after the 19th century removal of the Cherokee and, and forced removal from lands, ancestral lands, to um, parts of uh, Oklahoma. So this historical document is referencing this, this idea that comes about in, in America in, in the early 1900s of having to like prove, prove your, uh, literally like your percentage of blood as part of the tribe. And so Arthur, her, her ancestors are on this document and their names are listed as, as part of this. Um, and so that kind of forms the background of the bottom of the print. But then we have um, the solitary tree, uh, a little nest in the middle and, and birds and uh, flying overhead. And I think this combination of those images of environment and nature and specifically of this, like the nest, this idea of home and then birds as this moving migratory um, animal uh, with this historical document of saying, you know, we have been displayed, you know, this, this, this kind of terrible event and this displacement and this exile. Um, and then on top of that, having to kind of prove that you're part of this um, tribal nation together is kind of a very powerful statement on, on how we have treated indigenous populations I think, but she was also talking about how we treat our own environment and nature. I mean, I think that the the bird can become a symbol of of uh, an animal that is that's surroundings and environment have been displaced and by humans. And you know, in the same way, like by putting these side by side, we can talk about kind of fragility of environments and how. Um, you know, what it means to, to remove, um, to push out um, people or um, nature, you know, animals or, or plants from those spaces. So again, this is one that I, I wanted to talk about and bring up because I don't think it necessarily reads as like an overtly um, political or, um, you know, this art of resistance idea. But I actually think when, again, you, We'll look at what the content is here and look at this Arthur's artistic practice, you very much have an artist that's dealing with um, and, you know, this interrogation of systems of power and systems that are, um, you know, in place that have held people down. And, 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 you know, she talks about her practice in that way is, you know, informed by a concern for, environment, but also a concern for displacement and how we can, you know, heal and come back to you know, relocations of, of home and um, recover from that dislocation and separation. So um, again, this is one that I think is worth consideration and worth looking at. And um, as you explore the art and campus collection, and um, again, these two are both in the library. So um, out for people to explore and look at. So those are the two that I um, have to talk about. I'm gonna now turn it over um, to my colleague, Sydney Marshall, and she's gonna next. Yeah, so the two um, objects that I chose are both in the Art and Campus collection. Um, so the first one, obviously here you would see on campus uh, every day, it's outside um, right by Morrill Hall. Um, and what I kind of wanted to talk about was the, uh, how both what artists choose to depict, the materials they use um, can kind of be in response to like stated norms of expectations from uh, topics or from how things are typically depicted in news or media, but also then how those meanings have changed over time because both of, both of these have been in our collection for uh, quite some time. So that has kind of been interesting to see how these um, have 
gathered basically different responses over the years and how they've still kind of remained relevant um, to our uh, political situation over the years. Um, so this first one is uh, by Luis Jimenez and it's border crossing. Um, and so, you know, they are, there's figures here that are moving northwards um, through campus, right? There's a woman on the shoulders of a man and there is a small baby in her arms, which is kind of difficult to see depending on the angle. Um, but basically, this is a work of art that was created in the 80s in 1989 about. Um, and most of these other sculptures are, are uh, editions of five. And one of these is here in Iowa, which is actually kind of special because many of these are located either very near the border of US and Mexico um, or in more of like Southern states. So this is kind of a unique place for this sculpture to be. Um, and so really uh, Jimenez, as he is an artist who was living in the Southwest, was raised there. Um, I think it's interesting to bring um, kind of these, this personal background into his artistic process and into the creation of this sculpture. Um, so as we kind of think of immigration in America um, and basically how in the news it is typically more of a <laughs> movement to dehumanize or make into one lump of a crowd of people coming over the border. And I think in some of this artwork that is kind of a response against that. And you can see this as kind of humanizing the struggle of a family that's coming across the border, um, specifically for Jimenez and that he dedicated this uh, sculpture to his grandfather um, who did cross the border um, to make a new life here. So that's some, in, his own way, of course, personalizing that story. Um, but then also in the materials that he chose to use to create this sculpture as well as others, um, he used uh, kind of a strange material in terms of public sculpture in that he was using fiberglass and um, auto body paint to create this, uh, which is really kind of weird. Um, but <laughs> when you think about why he may have chosen to do this, uh, in the Southwest, he was kind of paying homage to uh, lowrider culture, materials that he had seen, you know, growing up and used in a very, in an art form really of creating cars and something that was honored in his life. Um, and then kind of elevating that into something that is considered more, uh, you know, traditional fine art. And I think that's kind of an interesting way to think about how is something uh, depicted in an artful way um, and what materials you use. Uh, so I think with that, he's kind of playing with this material and creating something really beautiful um, in the traditional art form. I think you have another slide, Lila. Yeah, so recently, another recent acquisition um, for us is a print also by Jimenez. And this is, Jimenez would do these kind of very detailed studies, he would call them, although they are truly, you know, artworks of themselves, because this is a very intense <laughs> process for a study. Uh, but this was created two years before the actual sculpture of border crossing. And you can see the same figures in the baby in the woman's arms. Um, you know, again, kind of showing this process of a family crossing the border. I um, mean, right now, this is on display in um, the lower gallery of Morrill Hall talking about memorial art and how that can be uh, seen throughout some of our collection too. Yeah, I think that's what I've got for this one. So then we have uh, Christian Peterson. So if you are familiar with our on campus collection, you have definitely probably seen Christian Peterson around. He is in the Fountain of the Four Seasons, Conversations, um, Library Boy and Girl, all over the place. Um, and I think technically when you think of his work, you may not immediately think of protest or having a very strong stance, but I think when you look through Christian Peterson's work, particularly when you're showing um, war images, uh, it kind of changes over time. And it's interesting to look at what his uh, point of view may have been. Um, we have many of Christian Peterson's uh, earlier works before he came to Iowa, which were traditionally commissioned for like medals um, or medallions or larger war memorials for World War I, especially. 
And uh, he was much more commissioned to do these works and has a kind of traditional uh, display of like, either not so much either glorifying the purpose for going into war or really honoring um, the sacrifice of these soldiers and all of that. But then when um, this was made in, so this is 1944, he was already on campus. Some of his works were of course commissioned, but a lot of um, things he was able to create more on his own with his own ideas basically. And you can definitely kind of see how this changes his depictions of war with this. Uh, this is called Price of Victory or Fallen Soldier. And you know, if you think about when this was created in 1944, many students, people he was teaching um, were going off to war and you know, dying. And many of the uh, popular depictions of war, depictions of like going into war as being an honorable patriotic thing are definitely not shown in this uh, sculpture. And I think choosing to show uh, more of the sacrifice and the, you know, not so beautiful aspects of war is a choice that Peterson made um, to, you know, to show, like if he thought it was important to show that it's not all roses and glory when you go to war and that your many of your friends may die or, uh, he had a pretty distinct view of the price of war. Um, and so I think that was part of his point of view. It was put on display in the Memorial Union um, during this time and you know, towards the end of the war and afterwards, but it was actually then taken down for having too many people um, have a really just like sad response to um, having to look at this image for um, you know, during their daily life when so many of their friends had gone and died in the war. Um, but this one I think is especially interesting in that how this has changed over time, the perception of this piece in that um, this was also put on display in the Vietnam War, uh, which the student response during the Vietnam War is definitely more of a uh, not so patriotic view in some ways maybe of going to war and getting drafted, um, especially in popular de depictions of World War II versus Vietnam. Um, so I think it makes kind of sense that this may have been received in a completely different way. Um, and then this has been in, on exhibition in more recent years as well to very different reactions in that, you know, for many people of a younger generation, they have, or the country has been at war for their entire lives. So I think it's kind of an interesting uh, way to look at layers of meaning that get added to art. I think that's it, Lila. <laughs> so then we have Adrian. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy. Hi, so I'm gonna talk about first something a little bit different from what we've been looking at. Um, you know, the traditional idea of fine arts being um, paintings, works on paper, um, like Lila showed, sculpture, um, like Cindy just showed. This is actually a piece of glass and Glass is a really interesting media. Um, it's something that's been made for a very long time since ancient times, but it, studio glass didn't really take hold until about the 1960s. So in a lot of way, it's had this kind of really new contemporary, just in the past you know, 60 years or so history of what can be done by one artist with this material. So you get a lot of really interesting variations and unique ideas portrayed through, through glass. And so this specific object is made by a glass artist named Preston Singletary who lives in Seattle. And he is a really amazing glass maker but a very unique one. Glass is like other media, traditionally pretty un, uh, non-inclusive. It's mostly men, then women start coming into it and not a lot of black and brown people or Native Americans. And so here it's obviously getting better like many media, but here we have Preston who is Clinkett. So he's Native Alaskan. And he grew up as an artist, not quite sure what his media would be and, and really came into glass through his friends, um, other glass makers in the Seattle area, which is really known for glass and really found a way for him to express his, his cultural, cultural beliefs, uh, the stories of his culture, and to kind of show that 
Native Americans are making glass or making glass, making art. They're here, they're still producing, you know, they're not part of our history. They're part of our present and our future and kind of asserting a voice there, especially in a field with not a lot of diversity. And so he uses glass to tell the stories of his people and his culture, to use the traditional motifs, as you can see on this uh, feather, those motifs are very kind of symbolic of that Pacific Northwestern region and his Alaskan heritage. Um, so we've probably seen symbols like this on totem poles and things like that, more traditional materials, but he's made them his own. So he's kind of taken them and, and repurpose them into kind of his own form and his own language, really, but really honoring the tradition of his, of his people. And so you see in this feather, it's cased glass. So it's many layers of glass, different colors that he then cuts through with sandblasting. So that's how you get that kind of glowing red that is within the glass itself. And it's oil on feather because that little droplet at the bottom that you see is a supposedly a droplet of oil. And that oil then makes you start to think about the Exxon Valdez spill in Alaska and what oil means to Native, Native Americans throughout this country, you know, how it's encroaching on people's lands and, and their traditional lands and their traditional ways of life and how it's, it's produced really some ill effects on, on people and how they live and what does that mean? So, you know, it's not that overt protest or resistance, but it's, it's very much talking about the issues that plague these people and their culture and their ways of life and how we need to recognize that and continue to have these conversations. And art is a really great way to open up the door to those conversations. Preston also truly believes that glass as a media is something or as a medium is something that he uh, can bring to other um, Native Americans, Aboriginals, different groups, uh, different groups around the world as a new media to use as kind of those traditional materials are disappearing. You know, the cedars and the barks or the baskets or whatever they're using are, are less, are becoming rarer and rarer and harder to find. Glass is a media that you can really translate those motifs and your statements about who you are into glass really easily. And so really trying to open the door to that diversity and to bringing in new voices into glass as a media, again, is another way to assert who you are and, and what, you, what you want to talk about through your art. And this is actually on view at the Brunier Museum, um, Art Museum right now in our front gallery, the recent acquisitions exhibition. So it's actually part of our permanent collection, which is separate from the Art on Campus collection, but you know, they come out pretty, pretty often. And then this next one is probably the most aligned with the idea of protest art um, and, and resistance. And this is an artist, her name is Fabiana Rodriguez, and she is from Oakland, California. Uh, and this specific um, print is a digital print, but it's based off of original work of art. Um, Faviana is an activist, an artist, a public speaker, um, a campaigner. She, she really kind of covers the field and making and using art to get her points across to the world, right? And so it's talk about the things that are important to her, social justice, gender equality, um, issues with racism and, and equity and inclusiveness and climate change and uh, our planet, what's happening to our planet. So she kind of covers all of these through her art and she uses her art to speak for her, but also, you know, speak with her as she, she uses her voice very often too. And this specific prints, we actually were able to purchase a few years ago to add to the collection and for part of an exhibition that we did in, in conjunction with the World Languages and Cultures Department. And this print, Dolores, a warrior for all living beings is, is very typical of, of what um, Fabiana does. And it's from a singular work of art that was made specifically for Stanford University, but then she was able to recreate it through a process called Gicle, which is just a digital print. So a limited edition of these prints, but then that makes it accessible, available, it's doesn't, it's obviously not nearly as expensive as one singular unique work of art. It's uh, pe other people can buy it, can have it, can share it. And that's really important to her, you know, art needs to be accessible too. And so this print um, is talking about Dolores Huerta and Dolores Huerta was, oh no, I'm losing my lights again, sorry. <laughs> Dolores Huerta 
is really well known for her work to um, unionize and, and help originally beginning with uh, the migrant workers in California. And she began with Cesar Chavez, the United, well, I'm sorry, it was the National Farm Workers Association that then became the United Farm Workers. Um, and unfortunately for a long time, C Cesar Chavez is the person that people know, you know, they didn't realize there was this woman who worked with them just as, as much and was just as important to the cause. And, and so she's really coming to her own and at 91 years old, she's still out there, still kind of fighting the good fight for, for the people who are voiceless, which is amazing. And for her, she practices nonviolence, which has, of course, ended in violence on her, you know, because by standing and, and practicing nonviolence, people try to move you still. And so she's become, a, she's an incredible person and woman uh, for the rights of others who don't have rights and, and kind of creating space to have their voices heard. And so obviously Fabiana is honoring her here. And so this image shows mother nature cradling the world, right? C cradling earth, caring for earth, caring for the world um, in this very kind of motherly way. And then you also see behind the figure, the, the kind of, it's a dog actually, it's a Sholo dog, um, which is a, a native um, Mexican hairless dog that comes is about 3000 years old from Aztec times. And that, that dog was actually very sacred and helped protect and protect, you know, when you passed away and you went on to the afterlife, that dog was really important in protection and, and showing you the way forward. Um, and so kind of signifying how that protective nature of that dog in that image. And then you see all the flora and fauna, which talk about how important, you know, this is to our earth, having this flora and fauna that creates the basis of the planet that we live on and honoring that. And then finally, that little butterfly in the top corner is a signature image of Fabiana. Uh, she created, I think about 2012 and it's a monarch butterfly and it's, it's signifying migration is beautiful. She often puts that statement with it. The idea that migration is, is happening everywhere and it's important and it's, it's, we need to recognize it and honor it and, and let people in to our country and, and talk about how they help us um, and how we are all you know, Americans and what that means and how it, you know, migration really kind of makes us all better as a culture. And so again, she's, she's really doing amazing things and a lot of work and really making her art accessible to on all platforms to people all over the world. And so let's go to the next slide, Lila, please. So this is just a, a final quick one. So if you're interested, Fabiana also is very, very vocal about and sharing um, how to create poster art. So that quick YouTube video, it's about three and a half minutes. She, she teaches you how to, to make an effective poster, um, a protest poster and or political poster. And then you, you also go to our website. You can also print out different elements to create your own collages and your own posters um, and your own designs and talking about how to use those. So it's a really kind of interactive way if you're interested to start doing your own kind of art that talks about the things, the causes that are important to you. And then of course, um, our videos, which I, Lila will probably mention in a second. Uh, we've got a lot of bit more videos on our YouTube page. Yeah, I, I mean, I can just quickly say that we, we have a lot of programming through university museums um, that go along with our changing exhibitions. So there's a lot um, to see. And again, we have just sort of scratched the surface of what we have. I mean, we have 30,000 objects to explore. Um, over 2,500 of them are public artworks that are um, around campus. Um, so we have an online database where all that is searchable. Um, and then we have here the YouTube channel where we have both um, some of our videos of our past programs, as well as videos about our collection. And I'll go to this next page um, that has our website information. That is kind of the central point where you can get to all of those different resources um, that we have available. And, and also, of course, um, learn about how to come into the museum spaces and, and use them and see, see the art. Um, so let's see, I will stop sharing my screen and then we'll turn it over to questions. Okay, I think we are all back together here. Thank you, Adrian, Lila, and Sydney so much for this informative session. I, I have learned so much myself and I'm sure the audience has as well. Uh, I do have a couple of questions though, and I wanna come back to this theme of 
art as resistance in a moment and just how powerful art can be uh, very much as as much as the protest signs that we see images of. Uh, so I want to come back to that question, but, but let me start by saying um, not only do I work here at Iowa State now, but I also was a student here 30 some years ago. And I'm wondering, and I've walked past uh, the, the art, um, the sculpture and, and several of them and just hadn't had the kinds of insights that you've shared with us today. What can I do and, and maybe people who struggle like, like I do to improve my visual literacy? I mean, I, I, I can start. <laughs> uh, I think a lot about this and, and in our classes and programming, that idea of how to become literate and, you know, taking in visual material. I mean, I guess the first thing I would say is slowing down and being thoughtful and aware of the how we look at things. You know, I think that uh, when you're moving around campus, you have a place to go, you know, you're on you're just walking by things and making kind of a note to yourself or making it a practice to, to be thoughtful about how you look and like think about what it means to look at something closely and to take it in and to, you know, consider this idea that art can have, be just as valuable a text or, um, you know, way to talk about something as, a book that you read or a scientific article or, you know, that, that art has meaning and has um, space for kind of perspective and dialogue and being able to access that. So I think it starts with, you know, closely looking at something. And, you know, then with that, you can start to think about um, interpretations. And, you know, I'm not going to say like that you can immediately get all of those things. And, and maybe you do need to go in look at, you know, research the artist or think about the material or think about maybe historical reference, you know, look up different historical references. So I think there, there can, as with any field, you know, be the uh, space where you need to kind of uh, look, look further, like beyond, beyond the object itself to help inform some of those interpretation, you know, interpretive um, investigations. But I think just really starting with the idea of kind of looking and I think knowing that your own observations can be a valuable way to access, you know, things that the artist is, is getting at and allowing that looking process to help you develop questions and pursuing those questions and then following up and looking at them. And then I guess from just more, uh, <laughs> you know, like a museum technical standpoint, I mean, we do try and have information and material out there to help you with this, you know, like don't, you're not alone. Um, you know, we are a resource in, in that we put some interpretation materials for you to access. But I think for me, it, you know, it starts with, with looking. I don't know if anyone wants oh. to add. No, I think that you, the last thing that you said about, you know, absolutely everything you're saying is totally just taking the time, but also the questioning is that, you know, art doesn't have one answer. The artist might want to want you to believe that, but honestly, we art is subjective and all of our opinions are valid. And so what you see and what you understand about a work of art is absolutely just as important as, as what it means. And so learning from what you see and then maybe finding out more about the art and, and understanding, oh, well, I didn't quite see that, but you know, how does that evolve into what I interpreted it? And you know, having those conversations with yourself to begin with, but hopefully with others later on about um, you know, what did you see and, and what did it mean to you? And, and those are the conversations that will help you learn more about an art form a work of art, an artist, um, and, and inspire you to, to connect with a work of art because you know you get that kind of immediate well I don't understand art and and it's not about understanding about it it's just about taking the time to start looking and start participating with it I don't know I think you guys covered it but I was just going to say something <laughs> that is unique on campus that's kind of good for students or faculty is that so much of this art that is out is out for many years at a time 
that you can see in different seasons, different moods and states of mind of yourself and different um, things that are happening in the world. And so I think it's interesting to kind of get that chance to look at these things, even in passing, if you even do stop only just for five seconds, every time that you walk past it, like over time that's, that uh, image or sculpture or whatever you're looking at may change and you can kind of see um, different perspectives as you grow as a person and as <laughs> you look at the art. So I think that's something unique with our collection that you have that freedom to look at something for, you know, possibly many years in a row, basically. Yeah, I really saw that with the border crossing uh, piece, uh, art work of art that uh, in the two seasons with the two pictures, I really had a different interpretation in looking at each one of those. So I think that's a wonderful way to encourage us to just take the time and, and notice uh, so thank you for that. Now, getting back to the question about this idea that art is very much as impactful as the, the protest signs that we see um, even on display, you know, sadly, as recently as today, um, how do you see ways in which we can honor artists in, in the same way that we, we gather and we protest? How can we sort of individually um, raise awareness when they uh, do challenge the status quo with their with their art. So I'll I'm just going to jump in real quick. Um, so the first thing, especially for museums, is to pay the artist. You know, they need to be paid. They're creating something. It's their life. It's their lifeblood. It's how they exist. And so for museums, you need to pay them. You. you it's not about just. You know, there was a, a recent story of downloading these posters and, and using them in an exhibition and that's that's not okay without the artist's knowledge because it was considered public domain and and even if it is protest art that was for public to take to protest it wasn't for a museum to take to put on the wall so it's about making sure that they are they are able to work because we are supporting them financially that way and I think for public it's it's always kind of talking about the artist who created something, making sure that that is it, you know, you're putting that out there, you know, you're not trying to pass it off as your own, not that people would, but you know what I mean? Just that, the idea of, of representing um, and supporting through kind of vocalizing who created this and why you like it and what's important about it and how it connects to what you feel is important. Uh, and just always having, making sure that that's, that's available for people to understand. Yeah, I mean, I think I would, I would, you know, add on or echo what Adrian's saying, this idea that, you know, you buy, by engaging with artists and the art that they're making and having, you know, letting that art uh, be something that you're thinking about, having dialogue about, respecting, thinking is important, um, and like, taking that and bringing it into conversation, I think is a very powerful thing, you know, and, and, and supporting, supporting that art, you know, as an, as an institution, we can be a steward of that. But I think as an individual, you can also, you know, contribute to that in the way that you go to museums, the way that you go to galleries, the way that you engage with public art or community art projects. And, um, you know, again, I think a lot of it for me is, is about acknowledging that art is not like a lesser <laughs> form of expression or field, you know, that it's, we have, um, you know, that art historically and, you know, now has always been a really important way uh, for humans to express and um, talk to each other about um, cultural, social, political ideas and, and, supporting that and, and being allowing that to be part of your world and the way that you're interacting with the world I think is is, is a good place to start is a powerful place to, to be yeah that sounds good I mean <laughs> those are all those are all great and I think also in general for individuals and museums uh, honoring 
the topics that those artists are protesting and speaking out against is another important thing. It can't just be we will be displaying these things on our wall, but then politically taking no action or no stance. I think it's uh, something that all museums can strive to be is that, you know, we're not a, you know, a neutral space of what we choose to show on our walls um, makes a difference. And I think honoring that um, is important as well. That's an excellent point. And, and Sydney, you, you touched on this when you were talking about some of the Christian Peterson um, works of art, but my, I'm wondering, um, you know, with the First Amendment and with free expression, also at times comes criticism. And how do you as professionals uh, and maybe the university museums, how do you see your process of of, of sort of um, um, recognizing the criticisms that might come with, with work with art that challenges the status quo, but yet um, maintaining this commitment to, to free expression. I think that's a long way of saying, how do you deal with the criticism? Um, sure, so, well, for me, I have not had to deal with that much yet. So we'll see what I would actually do if this came up. But uh, <laughs> in, I think with especially when I'm working in public art and um, commissioning and uh, creating these art and campus committees, um, it's something where we want to make sure that there are artists who have different expressions and have points of view. And I think um, knowing that we have these sets of values that we are starting with as far as like we are creating this committee for the specific acquisition process that is representative of the department or the building or you know whoever is going to be uh, the kind of end user or the representative of that acquisition. So it's something that they can stand behind and have their point of view expressed through the artist and it's kind of fitting those together so that if there is something where it's like well there's you know art can be controversial art will have a specific point of view no matter what you are acquiring and so I think as long as you know why you chose that person and why you chose that point of view I think then you can defend that as you know why you you chose it there's that's how you have to move about there's it's hard to to please everyone but if you are choosing to follow what the public art statement was and the the purpose of having that public art on campus in these different departments I think then you're pretty uh, able to accept the criticism and move forward and try to do better if there are, you know, I mean, there's plenty of valid criticism and it's a constant battle of how do you better represent yourself or the art that you choose to have on campus too. Yeah, I, I would agree with everything Sydney just said, but, and I would also say that, you know, it's a dialogue, you know, why are you criticizing it? What does it mean to you? What is it representing to you? What is your point of view? And how can I talk about what, why we have it and what it means to us or how it came into the collection? You know, sometimes these are historical objects that you don't have uh, uh, any connection to whatsoever um, that have been here for years before you and, and talking about the history of collecting and the history of, of museums and what that means. And, and understanding you know, how it can be hurtful to them and, and wanting to know more about that and having that dialogue because that is, we are an educational institution and it's about educating ourselves and educating people with the art and having these open dialogues because that's what art is so good at doing is, is opening doors to keep the conversation going um, and to have those tough conversations like Sydney said. I mean, I don't, I don't have a whole lot to, to add to that really. I mean, I think they, they covered it pretty well. Um, but I guess, um, yeah, I mean, I guess when I'm thinking about programming, I think it's important to be um, similar to like exhibitions and acquiring of objects, like thinking about different perspectives and thinking about how we can be really um, inclusive of different points of view and just challenging ourselves to be constantly striving to be better at that. And um, I think, that, as Sydney said, can be a space where if we are facing criticism, you know, if we have, we can say, you know, we, this is our thinking behind it. And, and this is, you know, what we're trying to achieve. I think it's a good place to then start that dialogue that Adrian is talking about of, of what, you know, why would this be something that's upsetting or, you know, how can we 
um, institutionally respond to that in a thoughtful, thoughtful way. Thank you. Yes, it's it's helpful to have kind of a foundation of understanding, and I think that your uh, comments throughout today's presentation have helped kind of collectively add to that thinking. I, I do have a question about uh, Lila. You mentioned all of the works of art that we are so fortunate to hear to have here at Iowa State University. And sometimes I wonder if students don't realize what a treasure we truly do have here on campus. Um, but but I'm wondering for each of you if you have other iconic works of art that you might suggest we put on our bucket lists, especially when it comes to this idea of, um, you know, art as challenging the status quo or as maybe a form of resistance. Uh, anything that you would suggest that we, we go see in your opinions? Are you, are you wanting this to be from our collection or just just any collection? Any any? I was actually thinking outside in the the outside larger the, world. In, yeah. the, in the world. To me, this is like kind of an overwhelming question because there are so there are so many different things that I can like think of or say that to me are powerful examples of this. And I think again, like just that idea that in the history of art, artists are often the ones who are pushing pushing boundaries, asking questions, making statements that are really powerful and, and contributing to, you know, change in social, political, you know, cultural spheres. Um, so, you know, I, I was thinking about, you know, when I think about this idea, um, I think you could talk about, you know, more historical examples like Picasso's Guernica. Like, I don't expect that Iowa State is ever, you know, we're not gonna acquire that, but it's an artwork to look at and to think about. Or, you know, I was thinking about the, when you said this idea of like art of resistance, like the Gorilla Girls and the artwork that they were making to draw attention to the Met and uh, just the lack of women artists there. Um, more kind of, I guess, artists that are thinking about race in America, like um, David Hammonds, Glenn Ligon, uh, Lorna Simpson, Kara Walker. You know, I think there's, for me, those are some artists that are making powerful work about that. And um, one artist that I've thought about recently that I think is making really powerful, like satirical photographs, Wendy Redstar talking about how we, like what is our contemporary understanding of Native Americans um, in this country? And so I don't know, I don't have a, I, I have a lot of different um, artists and, and I don't have one singular, you know, here's my iconic, my iconic artwork, but hopefully those names give you a place to start of, you know, here's some people that I think just off the, you know, off the top of my head or that I think of as, as doing interesting work that's pushing boundaries of um, different, all, all different topics really. So. Um, so I have a lot of different things, um, but I also do a lot of decorative arts. Obviously I picked a piece of glass uh, as my specialty. And so historically, one of the most interesting examples of glass that I've, I've gotten the chance to be around. And if you're ever in Corning, New York, it's at the Corning Museum of Glass is a vase called Les Hommes Noirs um, by Emile Gallet, so from around the turn of the century, so probably 1890s. Um, it's this amazing, almost hideous vase, massive vase that is black with a huge beast on it and all this imagery that Gallet was in France um, and it's talking about the Dreyfus affair and the persecution and arrest of a Jewish officer. And, and the, he you know, worked with his friend Zola, um, Emile Zola, you know, talking about this isn't okay. You know, this, this what's happening in our society and culture is not okay. And he used his medium of glass to create this incredibly unique artistic monstrosity almost. It's insane how crazy looking it is um, to make the point. And he was probably, he was incredibly well known at that time period, uh, which is weird to think about a glassmaker because he sold millions of pieces of glass to, to everyday people. And so it's just this unique mode that he used his platform um, to talk about this something that he thought was terrible in his, in his, with his people, what was happening. Um, but then I, I also am really drawn to artists that that 
are multimedia that are not just doing like one thing. And so, you know, we have a, a piece by Joyce Scott in our collection right now that I was able to purchase and she is a bead worker. And so she uses bead as her med beads as her medium. Um, her, and she also creates 3D sculptures from beads, but she also does performance and, and public speaking. And there's another artist named Vanessa German who does really, really amazing things. She's based in Pittsburgh um, using textiles and art and performance and poetry. And so I'm really drawn to kind of that holistic, getting it in all senses um, type of art that really kind of traces back their historical roots uh, along with kind of this contemporary viewpoint of it. Yeah, um, and I guess for mine, I don't, I don't have a specific artist that I want to bring up, but I would say, I think something that I very commonly hear when we're in the museum is like, oh, I've never been to this space, but I've been somewhere when I visited Paris or something like that. And I really, I want to encourage people to know that whether you're living in Ames or in somewhere else or countless arts organizations, particularly in Ames, the museums, the Memorial Union, the Octagon, CASA, many organizations that are deeply involved in the community and even in smaller artists that, um, are local and are deeply tied to organizations that are doing work in protest or to make their community better. And I think those are our organizations that are worthy of your attention and support. Um, and so that's something that I would encourage you to do is to find some of those local artists that you really can connect with and have the opportunity to likely interact with on a personal basis in your um, hometown. And that can kind of, um, you know, contribute a lot to your community outside of, um, of course, visiting museums and these beautiful artists, which you should definitely still do. But I think it's great to realize that at all levels, um, there are these spaces in communities all over the place. Well, thank you. I realized it probably was a little cruel of me to <laughs> ask you to pick out just one thing, uh, but but now we have several several stops on our to do list, not only outside of Iowa State, but especially here at Iowa State. And I want to thank you so much for your time and your expertise and and sharing these works of art with us. Uh, it, it fits so beautifully with our theme this year of some assembly required and this idea of protest and resistance and challenge. And we really did learn a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you, University Museums. And uh, thank you for those who are watching. Thank you for having us.